Association of SAN, the principal partner of Falano and Falan, Mr. Femi Falano, SAN, the senior manager for the Africa program at the Open Society Justice Initiative, Professor Chidi Anselm Odinkalu, the publisher and editor in chief of the Corruption Cases Journal, and uh, activist, uh, social and political activist, Mr. Richard Akinola. The moderators, Dr. Ruben Abati and Mrs. Shola Shiredi. And of course, our host and the publisher of uh, Gavel International, Mr. Mustafa Adekunle Okmushaki. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, let me thank my dear brother, Mustafa Okmushaki, CEO of uh, Gavel International for the kind invitation to participate in this important conversation on the questions around reporting of virtual court proceedings. Reporting of court proceedings is a crucial exercise of the right to fair hearing, uh, a cornerstone of which is that hearings must be held in public. Uh, how is it that, uh, how that right uh, will be given full expression when court proceedings are within the encrypted confines of virtual platforms is really the subject of our conversation uh, today. How do we give full expression to the right to public hearing when uh, court proceedings are you know, within the virtual environment? The Attorney General of Lagos and Ekiti States, I, I believe, deserve our commendation for bringing the matter before the Supreme Court. Uh, they asked the court to determine whether having regard to the constitutional requirement that court proceedings, except for some exceptions, must be held in public, uh, court hearings by the use of technology, by remote hearings of any kind, whether Zoom or WhatsApp or Skype or Microsoft uh, Teams or any other audiovisual or video conferencing platform, whether any of these virtual platforms Hearing a case by these virtual platforms can in any event be constitutional. The Supreme Court, while dismissing the suits themselves as premature and speculative, nevertheless said that as things stood today, virtual court proceedings are constitutional. This wise approach of the court uh, probably saved our system of justice another catastrophic round of technical decisions around the constitutionality of virtual proceedings. It may also be cautiously taken as a signal that the court expects our courts, as the lower courts, to go down this new path with as little attention to technicality as possible. So we're at a point where at least we know that virtual hearings are legal. You know, and, and this means that the court, and this is the Supreme Court, is satisfied that appropriate means can be found to ensure that hearings are public and that the press and indeed members of the public can access the proceedings. Now, the technical issues around this is straightforward, uh, are straightforward enough. And I'm talking about the technical issues around accessing the virtual platforms. I think that they're fairly straightforward. If, for example, we take the Zoom platform, which we're using now, if this is the preferred option, the host, who may be the registrar of the court, will simply invite the, the press by making available the relevant coordinates of the meeting to enable uh, the press. And of course, when we say press now, of course, we're not talking about necessarily just the print media, but we'll come to that in a moment. Would we just enable uh, the press or members of the public to log on to the proceedings? Just as a physical court can only sit a determined number of persons, so the virtual court, depending on the platform being used, would probably have a stated number of persons who can you know, access the proceedings. Practice directions may have to indicate how and in what order invitations will be issued, especially to the public. News reporting today is, of course, no longer the preserve of traditional media. Every blogging, uh, every uh, blogger, microblogger and other social networking services are now entitled to describe themselves as the press and, 
And I dare say that they have the same constitutional protections as the traditional media would have, given that our definition of freedom of expression does not restrict this in any event to uh, the press, uh, uh, as we understand that, uh, that word or that expression. But this also means that all of the bloggers and micro bloggers and all people on Twitter and all the users of micro uh, of social networking services are also subject to the same restrictions and liable to the same sanctions as the traditional media if they violate uh, the, the, uh, the, the laws respecting uh, issues of confidentiality, avoidance of prejudging cases, scandalizing witnesses, uh, jeopardizing fair trials, you know, by media trials, and all of the various violations that are possible. I think, it, I think we're in an interesting place because in the past, it was always the, well, the traditional media that could be accused of uh, violations or could be sanctioned for violations. But now it, 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 it seems that practically everyone on social media who chooses to uh, publish or publicize the proceedings of a court, not, 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 not comments after the proceedings, but actual proceedings of the court, and report the proceedings of the court, will be subject to the same uh, restrictions uh, that um, the traditional media have always had uh, through, through, through the years. In, in 2018, you know, a, a British court jailed uh, for 18 months the, the chair of the, U, the UK Legal Defence League, uh, Mr. Stephen Yaxley Lennon. It's, I think he's, he also calls himself Tommy Morrison. Now, here was a man who was broadcasting on social media outside the Crown Court in Leeds in the UK, where a trial was taking place. He was accused of broadcasting live, right? And uh, within uh, hours of, his, uh, of this broadcast, over half a million people had viewed the, 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 the broadcast. And the court felt that uh, his actions could have cost the court of, uh, the hundreds of thousands of pounds in rerunning the trial because of the prejudice that was introduced uh, by his reporting of the case live uh, in, 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 the, in the manner that he did. Now, the, the question here, of course, is where are the limits? And I, I hope that these are the questions that will be considered. Where are the limits to the sort of reporting that will take place? Because when you have a virtual recording, such as we are here, practically everyone, of course, recording, actual recording of it can be controlled by the host. But it is possible, for example, even if you are controlling my, uh, even if you are controlling recording, if our host today, uh, Shola, is controlling the recording and is not allowing us to record, it's possible for me to have my own little camera, just my phone here, and I can record everything that has been said and done, which is also possible for the virtual trial. And I can run, uh, I can actually, you know, uh, immediately broadcast this on social media. Now, these types of problems and these types of, of situations are what uh, perhaps uh, practice directions may have to address. What are the limits? Clearly, uh, no one is allowed except with permission to publish uh, live proceedings of a court. But, you know, uh, we, we need to really determine how this will work. We need to ask uh, the, the, the relevant questions. And I think that in developing this, these uh, practice directions, the media has to very quickly occupy the space so that the courts do not, uh, without adequate information and with, uh, without adequate sensitivity to uh, the rights of the press and all of that, do not develop a set of practice directions that create more trouble than uh, they are designed to solve. So I think that uh, this is one of the reasons why these sorts of conversations are important, because I hope that the proceedings of, of our conversations here will go possibly to the Supreme Court and possibly to the chief judges of our courts so that they get a sense 
of what needs to be done by way of practice directions and what the problems and issues may be. One of, obviously, just by way of uh, the sorts of considerations that uh, media, the media ought to have in reporting virtual, virtual proceedings. Of course, there are system requirements that have to be looked into. Uh, it's not enough for one to simply say that um, I have access or I'll be given access. We have to look at all the system requirements. What I've found uh, in the several, in the past few months, where I've been involved in quite a few uh, Zoom meetings or uh, WebEx meetings and all of these different platforms, is that very often, if the devices on either side are not adequate or the bandwidth is not adequate, you know, it, it just becomes a mess and it's impossible to actually get the best, um, uh, to best, get, get the best quality. So I think it's also important for, you know, uh, some kind of standardization so that there is the equipment that we use are the right sorts of equipment uh, that, that should be used for, for, for the purposes of uh, these virtual court proceedings. By and large, uh, my, my belief is that we are at a very interesting place in, uh, in court proceedings. We have all been talking for years about uh, computerizing our court systems, e-filing, etc. No one knew that we would quickly come to the place that we are in today. So in some senses, thanks to COVID-19, we have been very quickly dragged into, uh, the, into the virtual space. And I think that it's a good thing that that is the case. One of the questions that I would want to ask is that there's a whole question around what is the what, what type of platform will really serve our purposes in court proceedings? What type of platform? I know that several people already use, um, I know that several people uh, already use um, virtual platforms for arbitration. But for purposes of trials, you know, I'm not so sure that this Zoom platform or these sorts of platforms are the best. Because we have to look at situations where we're examining witnesses, we're showing them documents, we're referring them to various documents. What happens in those situations? Do we suspend the rules of evidence or, you know, some of the rules of procedure? I mean, how does a photocopy of a document look uh, virtually? Uh, is it, is, is it, if you show me even an original document virtually, is it still an original document or is it a copy of an original? Yeah. So there are issues that we need to resolve. We, we need to resolve several issues of uh, procedure and several issues you know, of, of evidence, just so that we're you know, better able to, uh, bet, better able to uh, navigate these proceedings in a manner that not only serves the ends of justice, but also when some obedience to the law. I think that an opportunity that this offers us is to get rid of as much technicality as possible. This is the opportunity that we are offered. And I'm so pleased that the Supreme Court did not even hesitate in saying that, well, as far as we're concerned, uh, virtual proceedings are illegal. I mean, it, it was a, really a breath of fresh air, considering the way that we tend to magnify technicality, you know, uh, to the point where Sometimes you wonder where justice is, you know, when uh, technicality assumes such huge dimensions. So I am so I am uh, hoping that the opportunity we have in virtual proceedings will also be an opportunity to dispense with several of the unnecessarily technical rules that we have in our adjectival law, in our laws of evidence, laws of procedure, and all of that. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, get to the heart of trials and get to the heart of the matter so that we're not bogged down unnecessarily by technicality. So I, I, I would um, end it by saying uh, again my thanks to, uh, uh, to the Gavel International for putting this very important conversation uh, together and to hope that this will be uh, not the, uh, won't be the last of these kinds of conversations, especially around virtual court proceedings, because I think uh, the implications, especially for our procedural laws and all that are so broad and so
deep that we must certainly engage uh, even uh, much deeper in order to be able to arrive at uh, a system and a framework that will work, especially for the ends of justice. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh